Sure. Um, All right. And we are live with Alex. Uh, Alex, how are you today? All right. Pretty good, Sonny. Great to, great to be here. Cool. Cool. I'm excited as well. So I usually start with uh, where did we meet or when was the first time we met? I'm trying to remember. It probably wasn't too long ago, right? Maybe like a year or two, was it? <laughs> it was in yeah, the coffee say, shop yeah, in Yorkville. It would have been, yeah, I guess fall of 2019. So um, a little bit over a year ago now, um, early right. fall 2019. As I recall, right. a coffee shop in Yorkville. Not sure exactly which one, but uh, I yeah. think I, I think I, I think it was me just like literally emailing you guys on your on your website or something like that. Um, at the time, I think I was with Kraken, and or maybe not, but uh, but yeah. yeah I, I, so, so I think we just uh, just then formally announced what we're up to, um, and yeah, I think you reached out to, and. We're in town for in Toronto, and it was great to meet up. Yeah, yeah. So it's been it's been wow. It's been like uh, it, I mean, a year you think is like a short time frame, but it feels like so much has happened in that time. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I guess twenty twenty <laughs> itself has dragged on. So yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay, so yeah, as I was mentioning to you earlier, really one of my main kind of focuses or goals is to really just kind of get people's story. Um, and as I was mentioning, I treat Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity where. You know, I think all of us, we've, you know, it, it touched, it's touched us in different ways and has impacted ours. And, and there are a lot of us that have like dedicated our lives to this field. And so I think for a lot of people who are maybe on the fence or just find it curious, I think it's very interesting for them to maybe get insight into like, how the heck are people like building lives off of this like magic internet money? So, so and I think you have a fascinating story. So let's, yeah, so let's start with wherever you want to start essentially, like uh, where does your story begin? Yeah, sure. So I'll back up um, and just kind of explain my background pre-Bitcoin, um, very software heavy. Um, so I've been programming since I was a kid, um, always enjoyed, you know, looking at new languages, looking at new tech, um, seeing what was getting built. Um, I don't think I understood how profound software itself was um, growing up. And then, you know, that sort of crept in and, and I came to realize that this world really was quite different from what came before it. Um, and, you know, I sort of grew up with software around me, uh, but I took it, I think, for granted initially. Are you um, from it Canada? Until, Are you from Canada uh, so or elsewhere? I am originally from Bulgaria, uh, which I suppose factors into the story as well. Um, I left mm. Bulgaria in 94, which was a period when some inflation was starting to kick up, you know, relatively serious inflation. Mm. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that some really extreme, uh, you know, true hyperinflationary episodes um, came down um, all the way into kind of 97. And so I didn't live through the worst of that, but it certainly has some bearing um, on my appreciation for Bitcoin and kind of sound money. Um, and some of the forays that I've taken into that, uh, just kind of seeing what a hyperinflationary episode can actually do to a country and a currency um, and realizing that, you know, fiat money, um, while it might be stable in the West, um, has had in Bulgaria and elsewhere so some pretty horrendous uh, inflationary episodes. I have a question. Like, when is something considered hyperinflationary versus just inflationary? Yeah, I mean, is there like an actual number? Do you know? I'm that? not sure yet. I imagine that there's probably <laughs> someone who's probably tried to define to say kind of what is the actual number. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In Bulgaria in '97, but... it would have hit uh, multiple kind of hundred percent per month um, type of um, insanity. So at some point, oh, wow. kind of a currency board had to be um, brought in, and you peg the currency to uh, the left of the Deutsche Mark, which invariably means that it is now effectively pegged to the euro. Um, in order to kind of stop that from from happening. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm no expert on how to produce or control fiat currencies, um, but uh, it certainly had an impact on me just in terms of an appreciation for sound money. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people uh, like myself that are kind of born in Canada and raised here, they they don't really appreciate, uh, you know, the importance of sound money and, and the fact that, you know, there's the, the reality in a lot of other places around the world. It's, it's very different. So, yeah, anyway, so very interesting. So what so what happens then? So I guess you're you have an, you have a fascination with uh, the Internet. Uh, you have a disdain for perhaps, um, you know, money printing and uh, and what goes on, you know, behind the closed doors over there. And then what else, what happens after that? Yeah, sure. So, and certainly on the, I, I say it as it gave me an appreciation for sound money. I don't think I came to realize how dangerous fiat money really is. Um, even when I was a child and probably even in my, in my early twenties, um, I came across a few people who started, um, influencing me to some degree. This is kind of outside or, um, before the Bitcoin, um, world itself, but, um, you know, I don't claim to be, 
I don't think as a teen, I, I would have had the same perspective, but certainly it's a kind of growth that you start realizing that the world that you inhabit, um, you know, came to be in a certain way, um, that a lot of the things that, and the properties that you see, uh, you've either taken for granted or sort of not appreciated um, how profound they are. Uh, but where I can lead to from here, so I went to school um, in Montreal, I went to McGill, uh, which is what brought me to Montreal in the first place, um, started in 2006. And you know, again, into software, um, I was very into programming languages. Um, and I think this will weave throughout the story. Um, very interested in how to specifically produce correct software. Um, so software is very easy to write incorrectly. Um, and in the worst case, it's very easy for software to look like it is correct for a long time, um, only to have some sort of edge case or bug appear. Um, so that was programming languages and the expression of programs um, was a lot of my main interest um, kind of going through school. And as I recall, it was something like the summer of 2010 that I started seeing some chatter in kind of software tech circles in Montreal uh, about this Bitcoin thing. Um, because I was kind of into software, I would just pounce on some technology that a lot of people were speaking about. So it was not then, you know, kind of one major thing that happened, say that summer, mm. I was probably opening um, and sort of downloading source code for all sorts of different projects. And this is just one of them that I came across. Um, I did not realize how important it would be to the world or to me um, in the future. And so I can't say I got into Bitcoin then, uh, but that's just kind of the first time I happened to cite it. Um, so at the time I had been doing also a lot of uh, kind of web application development. And one of the sites I was producing um, or thinking of launching was a kind of pay what you want music service. So, you know, some musician can upload some music um, and folk, people can download it and, you know, they can pay whatever they want for it. Um, I started looking at various payment integrations. There wasn't Stripe um, at the time and I was into kind of the Amazon tech world. Um, and so I started looking into kind of Amazon payments. Um, I remember briefly thinking, hey, maybe that Bitcoin thing um, could work here um, and concluding that actually, no, it probably wouldn't just because, you know, you're, it's already a crazy enough idea to just do something like pay what you want to, for some music. And I couldn't even think how to direct people to, you know, acquire this Bitcoin and had, how to price it, how to send it to each other. So um, really wish I had dug deeper then. Um, I say this story almost like the many times that I almost fell into the rabbit hole, uh, but in hindsight, stupidly did not. Um, well, you, so what that, year was this one, this this time? Like, so 2010 was the first time you came across it. And now- Yeah, was, that's when I came across it and I was building that site that summer. And yeah. I, I say this just because I remember it being a little bit in the periphery, but again, um, I would not say I was into Bitcoin then um, mm -hmm. in any serious way. Um, through kind of 2011, 2012 years, um, it started popping up a lot in my circles, uh, mostly frankly for kind of darknet purchases. Um, and I found that to be an interesting use case, which is, you know, obviously people need um, some kind of money that is not controlled by a government if they're going to engage in activities that are considered illicit. Um, and so that was the first time that I think I came to realize this thing has legs because, you know, there are always going to be black markets. Um, and you know, whether, you know, one participates or not, that is going to spur the use of some currency. Um, and so that was my first time realizing, hey, this thing, even if it never gets outside of that particular world, will forever need um, to exist in order to just enable that. Um, but again, I think I just had too technology focused a view of how what Bitcoin was and, and what it was for. Um, so it was very shallow understanding, if you will. Um, and again, I didn't think of it as as money. Um, I remember having kind of an argument with my roommate in 2013 about is Bitcoin a currency? And I sort of wrote down the properties of a currency and said, here's why, you know, I think you ought to appreciate that it is in fact a currency. He was very much of a kind of um, monolithic pro large government. Um, you know, if money isn't printed by a government, it's not real uh, mindset. And so I remember having those discussions um, and I think it's good. Sometimes these kinds of adversarial discussions are actually good to convince yourself of something that you believe internally, uh, but haven't actually come to realize um, the profoundness of. Um, so I think some of these arguments, I will credit him to this day as possibly sharpening my interest in Bitcoin because in debating it, um, I came to appreciate what it was. Um, and kind of once you, you have a certain skin in the game, just when you're taking a side and you're saying this thing is, this thing is serious and you're silly for, um, you know, brushing it aside and thinking that it won't be around. Um, and 
about then I started getting kind of more, more interested. I started realizing I didn't know enough about the properties of Bitcoin at the time. Um, I started understanding more about kind of having events um, and the fact that there's a finite supply. I uh, went to my first having party in uh, 2016, um, missed the one uh, prior to. Um, and yeah, that can lead, I suppose, I can lead then into how Knox came to be. But this um, is in 2016, you said? So what year did yeah, you say you were in? In 2016? Yeah, that was my first attendance at a, at a having party. Okay, cool. Uh, at a having party, what was that about? In Toronto or in Montreal? Oh, I was in, Mo- in Montreal, just, uh, you know. Just watching the watching the having roll in. Um, Interesting. And, and well, I guess before you get into the knock story, like what is the when did you have that like aha moment with Bitcoin? Like I mean, before you any started any company or whatever, I guess there must have been at one point where you're like, all right, I, I kind of see the light here. Yeah, I mean, it was. This is the point, I suppose. I don't think there was ever one aha moment. It was really a buildup um, mm. of me taking it ever more seriously. Um, and I think, as happens with a lot of people in the field, just kind of almost not hating yourself, but realizing that you should have taken it more seriously earlier, that all the signs were there, that you should have been, you know, digging way deep into the rabbit hole um, far along ago. Um, And so it's something that I think I'll regret, um, most everyone else will regret just not getting deeper into it earlier on. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. But but would you say it was at that? Ha- I mean, uh, I mean, you mentioned it more just in passing. But I'm just curious, was it at that having party where you like, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm like sold on this Bitcoin thing for sure. Like I'm gonna do something big in it or do something in it. Period. Yeah, no, I just used it as perhaps <laughs> a metric of seeing how seriously I was taking it. You know, the, right, the right, fact right. that four years prior to that, I was not, you know, paying attention to it. You know, the block mm. height um, wasn't something that I thought about. <laughs> um, I wasn't, you know, counting down to having or anything. Do you of the know? Sort. Do you um, know who Peter is at CoinKite? Uh, it's cold card and all that. He he recently tweeted uh, life goals: um, uh, earn revenue on every block. Right. Yeah, that, that's cool. Yeah, I, I haven't actually met uh, in person any of the Coin CoinKite people, but uh, mm. certainly a great company. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, so I good think to next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, in Toronto, we have those shelling dinners, as you know. I think. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Hope to. Uh, I had my first one uh, just, what was it, a few months ago, I think in September. Um, but it would be great to, to see another one. And I, I know the CoinKite uh, people came out to the one that um, was hosted prior. Um, I missed that one. So uh, hopefully we'll all get together and interact. I, I, uh, I think I paid for Rodolfo's dinner in exchange for a cold card that day. So nice. Okay. Proud owner. <laughs> Anyways, carry yeah, on. Nice, carry sure. on. Carry on. So yeah, I think I mean that that uh, about sums up at least my journey into Your Bitcoin. Into Bitcoin itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I didn't really start digging into the you know the money aspect of Bitcoin until probably as late as even 2018, 19, um, as we were doing um, you know this Knox thing. Um, really, my interest in what we're doing at Knox um, stems from an earlier accidental um, kind of entry into the world of insurance. Um, I came to in about late 2013, early 2014, uh, start getting really interested in insurance for reasons that I can't even explain to myself. It's just one of those things that, you know, you discover that there's this whole, this whole industry that exists that does something that you, again, took for granted, um, perhaps even thought was a scam. You know, I, I definitely in my life would have said most times you're buying a product, don't purchase the insurance. Uh, but then I came to appreciate that actually the ability to have the option of transferring a risk. Um, that originates in some scenario is super powerful um, and actually lubricates a lot of societal contexts where um, something can emerge uh, precisely because the risk averse uh, do not have to take on all of the personal risk. They can actually engage some activity and you know engage an insurance program in order to have um, the ability to transfer the risk that originates in that in that activity. Yeah. Okay. So cool. So yeah. I mean, I. I uh... I think I've mentioned this a few times, but I used to do, like actually have my life insurance license, my mortgage, my, my, uh, no, actually I used to do uh, mortgages and, and uh, mutual funds and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, definitely have an appreciation for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is definitely an odd fascination, right? Because um, I, well, I know with life insurance, it was like 
talking to people about their death is really not fun. <laughs> um, but I find talking about it in light of Bitcoin is a different story. Anyways, okay, so go back to your story. So what's so what happens in 2017 then? How like what uh, what bird you want? I guess maybe as a as a starting point, do you want to maybe do the do the 30 second on what Knox is and all that, just so that there's a bit of context, and then we can back into like I guess why you guys did it and all that. Yeah, sure. I think, yeah, of course, th that'll be super useful. So uh, Knox is a Bitcoin custodian, which is to say we hold Bitcoin on behalf of other parties. Um, and we have a really strong focus on insurance. Um, so I did not believe that, you know, I did not like the idea of a Bitcoin custodian, I think, for a long time, um, but came begrudgingly to accept that in many scenarios, it needs to exist. Um, and then in some scenarios, even if um, I think somebody should be holding their own private keys, a lot of people just do not wish to do that. Um, you know, Bitcoin allows you to be your own bank, but not everyone wants to actually be their own bank. Um, and so, yeah, that is what Knox really is. It's a um, key management service that allows folks to hold large sums of Bitcoin with Knox. Um, and again, in particular, we're really focused on insurance and specifically the ability to one-to-one -one, um, produce insurance policies um, where we are the insured, such that the theft and loss of Bitcoin resident in our systems um, can be covered by the insurance policy. Um, and we can get into further details of what that means um, and why we think that is important um, down the line. Uh, but that's maybe a good brief summary of Knox itself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have a lot of questions and stuff, but I want to save those. I want to first hear. Okay. So that, that's an interesting, like uh, it's a great introduction. Um, yeah. So, so maybe just talk me through kind of like how you guys got to this business in terms of, you know, as an opportunity, uh, you're, so you have this interest in insurance. You don't really believe in, uh, you know, letting others custody your Bitcoin, but you're starting to realize just like with insurance that, you know, maybe there is a, a world of, uh, you know, potential, I don't know what home offices, large exchanges, et cetera, et cetera, uh, institutions that, that just maybe due to regulatory reasons, due to other reasons, uh, may simply not want to, uh, to have their own Bitcoin or hold their own Bitcoin. So, so, okay, so but before that, how do you guys even, yeah, how do you guys stumble upon, you know, something like this? It's kind of like, kind of a counterintuitive yeah. or, you know, non-intuitive business, uh, if you ask me off the, kind of, you know, at first glance, but then it makes more sense as you think about it. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think briefly, I really always just thought of Bitcoin as, you know, something that people are holding for themselves. Um, and that's maybe why I never considered the custodial context. Um, but, you know, if, the, if they're a firm that is, for example, a fund or somebody who is holding Bitcoin on behalf of somebody else, um, then the equation completely changes. So uh, when you start seeing, you know, these kinds of multi-party relationships, um, that's when the custodial context becomes important. Um, and for us, insurance is really simple. It's you should hold your own keys. But if the value that you are holding is not yours, um, you are responsible for that value for somebody else. So for example, if you're the fund and you have LPs who have invested into your fund, um, then you, know, you really need to take risk management seriously. And in particular, we believe that since Bitcoin is a bearer instrument, which is to say that you know, um, the entity that maintains signing authority over some set of addresses owns um, the actual Bitcoin under underlying, even if the legal system disagrees, the protocol doesn't care. Um, if you can move the funds, you own the funds. So far as the protocol is concerned, and because Bitcoin exhibits these properties, you know, we firmly believe insurance ought to be an option, that the ability to cover against theft and loss uh, needs to be considered and needs to be available um, and needs to be an option for anyone wishing to hold you know, with a custodian. And so this is something we really strongly believe. And I can get into the properties of kind of what makes Knox insurance different from, from others. Well, I think before we talk about Knox insurance different from other insurance, you know, I've interviewed recently Jameson Lop, uh, you know, on chain capital guys, like, uh, um, and I think it was you or one of your colleagues that had recently mentioned to me about kind of the, uh, like, how if you think about it in terms of like, three, uh, three main things like in terms of sovereignty, I think it was simplicity, I forget the third one security, maybe. Um, and, and can you kind of help me think through like before I'd even compare you to insurance, like why as a Bitcoiner again, like last night I had a buddy of mine from university, like 20 years ago, called me, you know, and my first gut reaction, uh, he was asking me, oh, but I don't really trust myself and I would like to have insurance and this and that. I was like, no, dude, you just want to hold it yourself. Like, you know, you want to have, 
but I could see how there's this like reaction that every any high net worth individuals, home offices, they're always like, Ugh, like, you know, they just don't feel comfortable. So, but yeah, but anyway, so what do you, I just curious, like what are your guys is like, uh, how did that, like, how did the story kind of go on from there for you guys as well? Yeah, so I think, yeah, I can break down again, giving you a bit of the history of Knox, but uh, to your point, and this is something that Thibaut had written about previously, um, the idea that custody exists in a kind of spectrum. Um, so one of the neat things about Bitcoin is because it is non-physical and because it has, um, you know, on-chain capabilities like multi-signature capabilities, um, there's really a span of custodial activity that you can engage. Um, so we can start with the simplest, which is single signature, you know, self-custody. Um, your point about, you know, cold card, you know, you go get a cold card um, and you... Or a treasure or a ledger or whatever, sure. right? Okay. Um, and, you know, you have some set of addresses that um, with private keys held internally to that cold card. And so long as you, you know, maintain, um, maintain that cold card, you know, make, make sure that your mnemonic is well kept, um, you know, never revealed to anyone and never lost or destroyed, um, you'll be fine. Um, and maybe in the future, you step up and you say, you know what, I don't like this single point of failure. I want to engage a multi-signature scheme and, you know, I'll go get two cold cards or maybe I'll pair a cold card with a cobalt vault um, or maybe I'll do a paper wallet and do a two of three or whatever um, scheme I want. And, you know, that allows me to step up my custody game. Now, one of the points here is, I guess, once you're in the multi-signature world, um, you can also engage hybrid models where, you know, you might hold some subset of the keys um, and some other entity holds some other keys. So you get to um, both not have to entrust all of your Bitcoin with that entity, uh, but still know that there's some extra redundancy that is not necessarily handled by you, which maybe increases the aggregate safety. Um, and so this is kind of the unchained model. Um, it's something that we believe is going to, you know, be something that um, continues flourishing. So, um, you know, I've started believing for a lot of individuals, collaborative custody makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the other entity should not maintain, should not have signing authority such that they can actually in any case steal from that entity. Um, but perhaps this, this, this hybrid model kind of increases your, um, your overall security. And then that leads all the way to what Knox um, was born as, which is a fully centralized, if you will, custodian, which is to say that Knox maintains um, all of the keys and full signing authority over an account. Um, and, you know, different people will be comfortable with different, uh, of different models. Um, so I think like you, I believe that most people ought to fully self-custody. Um, I'm curious to see how this collaborative custody stuff unfolds um, and whether we'll see a lot more personal holdings um, transferring into that world, whether that be with Unchained or um, folks like Casa or others. Um, and then to your point, there are entities, however, that you know really desire um, the centralized custody model. Um, and that is what we first came to, to service. Uh, we, we are also quite, quite interested in developing some products internally for kind of the collaborative case. Um, it's a little bit too early to say, um, you know, when we're rolling some of that stuff out, but it's, a uh, it's a, an interest of ours internally, um, kind of thinking through this, uh, the continuum, kind of the spectrum of custody. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really curious about, uh, kind of like, okay, so part of why I'm doing whatever the heck this is, that's, that's, I actually call this show that whatever the heck this is. Uh, but no, um, the part of why I'm doing it is because I want to get people who are on the, on the fence in terms of like, wanting to do something and building on Bitcoin, whether it's a business or whatever it is, whether it's becoming, you know, a coder or, um, <clears throat> and, and yeah. And, and I think I want to just kind of help demystify some of the questions. And so one of the questions that I have is like, as a, um, as an entrepreneur in this space, you know, the types of products, I, at least I've helped build, they've been more retail focused. So it was more like you build something, you put it out there, you see if there's some traction, but how do you do that with something like yours? Because it's like, it's such a like it seems like obviously a much more like gargantuan effort number one like you don't like how do you how do you seek product market fit and you know what i mean it's not like you're bringing on oh we brought on a hundred people yesterday we brought on a thousand like the day after it's more i guess partnership driven so just curious like how did you guys uh yeah yeah just to go back to kind of the early days of like this business like how did you guys get to this point yeah, maybe let me go back to the early days. And one thing I'll highlight is that um, I started observing through my interest in Bitcoin that um, the Bitcoin kind of um, having cycles um, had certainly an effect on price. Of course, we've all seen um, the effect on that price. And you might even be able to make some predictions as to where some of these things go in the future as supply constricts. Uh, but they seem to also have an effect on how Bitcoin companies are built. So you kind of remember the crop of companies that got built 
in the you know 2013, 14 days. Um, and you saw some some companies being built after that. I know that you've been you know building companies in this space for far longer than I have, so um, you've seen a lot of this stuff firsthand. Um, one of the theories we had um, kind of going into into Knox, which we started in 2018, was the institutional adoption, kind of the story of people who actually need centralized custody, has already started um, in the sense that you know there were some early not so risk averse um, kind of institutions that started um, dipping their toes into Bitcoin. Um, the thought was, you know, this is now 2018. Uh, we're two years into the current Bitcoin epoch. By 2020, you know, the next halving will occur. Um, and from, you know, in the years going into that kind of 2020, late 2020 into 2021, 2022, a lot of the more mainstream institutions will want to enter the space, will want to take Bitcoin allocations. Um, and we had a belief that for them, insurance would be really critical. Um, so already when we started, there was, um, you know, people had purchased insurance policies, built some basic insurance, but um, our view into these policies was that, was that they were inadequate um, to cover the risks that were actually originated. Um, and that for a risk averse institution, some basic due diligence into these insurance policies would reveal that, as we say internally, most of these insurance policies are not purchased so that a claim can be made against them. Um, they're purchased for marketing reasons. They're purchased so that, um, you know, you're tired of saying no when somebody asks you, is your Bitcoin holding insured? And so you start, you want to say yes. And so you go buy some kind of insurance policy um, that covers you in some, you know, very specific um, context, but it allows you to answer yes to that question. So um, that was really our view is a legitimate due diligence into insurance will reveal these holes. And we want to produce an insurance policy where, the most serious um, due diligence will prove that the insurance underlying our product um, is really as comprehensive as um, as we say it is. And so that's what we, what we set out to do um, at the time. To this day, nobody um, runs one to one insured custody. And from our viewpoint, all of the insurance policies had a lot of holes in them. Um, and so really, we set out and said, we're going to build a Bitcoin custodian where the risk is appropriately um, transferred, or at least you have the option to transfer it. Um, and this has to pass muster with anybody who, who does their due diligence, no matter how deep they look. Uh, we need to be able to show that we have an insurance policy that is not uh, you know, full of holes. Interesting. Uh, but I, you know, a part of the story is kind of missing for me. So you took an interest in insurance. How does one go from like taking an interest in insurance to being like, we're going to build the best, you know, insurance policy around Bitcoin, like forget even build an insurance uh, program around something, but like Bitcoin, like was there something in between that gave you this confidence or was it just this like sheer, you know, interest in it? Like, did you, I don't know, yeah. I'm just curious. So I'll give you perhaps um, I need to fill in the kind of years from when I first started getting interested in insurance um, through to how I came to understand it in the context of kind of software systems. Yeah. Um, when I first got interested in insurance, I actually was interested more from um, the standpoint of um, doing things like long-term disability insurance um, for people who might need to engage, who their eventual outcome is a function of what they're doing at present. Um, and that if they can change how they behave at present, they might be able to affect their outcomes um, and might be able to lower their premiums um, for things like long-term disability. And so I started getting really interested in could technology and software in particular um, come in to reduce people's premiums uh, by doing things like, um, for in the case of what I was interested in, um, I was really interested in kind of biomechanical problems. So um, if you want, if you're paying premiums for potentially, um, you know, long-term disability claims down, down the line um, and you're someone who is, for example, responsibly active, could you use software to actually prove to the insurer um, that your the likelihood of you you know needing to make a long term disability claim is reduced? Uh, things like that. That allowed me to dovetail into an interest broadly in how does software insurance marry? Um, and I came to kind of look at the history of insurance and realize that pre kind of deep software age, um, insurance in the 20th century was always used for insuring against physical risks, if you will. So you crash your car, you total your car, you wanna be able to make an insurance claim. Um, you, you said you were into life insurance, you know, um, God forbid something should happen to you such that uh, you die. You want to make sure that, you know, your partner has an ability to get um, a claim such that it is less adverse an event in their life. 
Um, all of these things, you know, exist in physical space, right? Um, and I came to realize that the ability to, you know, price these risks um, is really oftentimes anchored on the fact that these things exist in physical space. So we understand how to model, model physical space and all of the actuarial science that goes into insurance policies um, is very well developed. And, you know, you can, you can produce these kinds of good models. A lot of this stuff breaks down in software risks in particular. So I started getting less interested in how can software be used to um, change existing insurance policies as much as what kinds of insurance policies will need to exist in an age of software uh, that did not need to exist prior. Um, so that led me to an interest in software systems can fail um, in very much the same way that um, you know, any, any physical systems can fail um, and that insurance policies will need to be produced for those systems as well. And the problem there is that the insurance industry, and this is true to this day, has a very difficult time pricing this non-physical risk. Um, and so that was just a very broad interest of mine. And I came to realize thinking that the theft and loss of Bitcoin is important to cover as, you know, with a basic insurance policy, noticing that all the insurance policies that existed for this were um, full of holes um, and realizing that the theft and loss of Bitcoin represents a very neat instance of this kind of non-physical risk, um, right? If somebody manages to spend your UTXOs, um, and they get spent away from addresses over which you have signing authority, for example, um, you have suffered a pretty, you know, you have suffered an irrevocable loss. I think most, uh, most Bitcoiners would be very sad to discover that their Bitcoin holdings have, um, you know, disappeared. And this is a very neat instance of this because, and I like to think of it as take somebody from the early, early 20th century and have them see this risk and see if they think you're insane or not. And they would sort of look at you and say this, I don't understand what you're talking about here. You're telling me that nothing, nothing physically in the world has been broken, but you feel that you are at a major loss, right? Um, they, would, they would find that instance uh, kind of very strange. And so that's perhaps a good heuristic to see if um, it is a kind of pure software risk. And so realizing that there's a going to be a massive market demand for this kind of thing um, in the next bull run, um, being interested in the technology of custody broadly, um, and then certainly being interested in how to produce better insurance policies, um, kind of all of these elements came together um, and we realized, hey, if we can actually build a vehicle that can do all of these things, um, then for a lot of entities in the next bull run um, that need legitimate comprehensive insurance cover, uh, this will be a super valuable vehicle in which to park uh, their Bitcoin. And just to be clear, you guys had an announcement recently with BitBuy, right? Where you did something with them? Is that something you can talk about or? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, um, <laughs> if I chose to, to go public with the fact that they're using uh, Knox custody to custody their Bitcoin um, and what that means um, in particular is that they become then the first one-to-one -one, um, insured Bitcoin exchange, if you will. Um, so because, you know, we are, take, we are holding the Bitcoin on their behalf in cold storage uh, and we have an insurance policy that covers their holdings one-to-one, -one, um, they can tell their customers, you know, we are effectively then the only exchange in the world in which your Bitcoin holdings are insured against theft and loss um, due to our use of Knox custody. So that's, that's the basics of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, no, I was going to say, and then like, uh, there was also something really unique, right? When I learned about your offering is that it protects against collusion. Like what, what, what like what's that about? And like, how does somebody even. Yeah, sure. That? So. I think perhaps it's worth then going through the properties of insurance that we think are important. So earlier I said, we looked at the insurance policies that existed and they're full of holes. Um, I should explain what those holes are. Um, so the insurance properties that we think are important for a custodian like ours to exhibit are the following. The ability to insure one-to-one -one in a dedicated fashion um, is super critical. So briefly what that means is if an entity wants to store, say, 50 million, 100 million, however much um, in Bitcoin with you, and you say, you know, we're going to insure that one to one, it means that behind the scenes, Knox, the custodian, is purchasing insurance and dedicating the ability to make a claim against that policy to that customer and that customer alone. Um, so the trick that we saw being played was people would do something like, you know, buy 50 or 100 million dollars worth of insurance. And then tell every specific account, you know, your account is insured up to 100 million, your account is insured up to 100 million, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but what they were doing is, as we like to say, double spending the insurance policy. So it can't be that every single one of these accounts is insured up to $100 million, if in the aggregate only $100 million of insurance is purchased. Uh, so that's something we really believe strongly that when we say an account is insured, that uh, behind the scenes, it is the capacity is purchased and it is explicitly earmarked for that customer and that customer alone. And that we have methods by which we can actually prove to the customer um, that that dedicated uh, coverage exists. Uh, uh, Alex, one quick question. So is it is it like, let's say it's $50 million of Bitcoin sent. Okay, there's a $50 million insurance policy. That $50 million of Bitcoin doubles next month. And now is worth $100 million. Um, as the, is the customer covered for the 100 or just the 50? Yeah, so that is one, their choice. They can choose to just maintain at the 50. But um, it's a very good question because when we say one-to-one, obviously Bitcoin... Um, priced in U.S. dollars is a volatile, um, you know, instrument, and day to day the value fluctuates. Um, so we are also capable of, and this is uh, what is typically requested of us, maintaining that one-to-one peg. So suppose, you know, beginning of, I mean, these last two months are a good example. Um, you know, suppose you come in beginning of October with fifty million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, that Bitcoin is going to be worth a whole lot more now. Uh, and will have fluctuated um, quite a bit day to day. Um, So we operate um, effectively between bands um, and our holdings are, when they are one-to-one insured, um, capable of fluctuating daily and we can maintain that one-to-one peg. Um, We are also, you know, we seek to be as transparent as possible about all aspects of our insurance policy. It is true that a price movement can be violent enough to blow a holding outside of a band such that a customer may be um, temporarily, um, you know, sort of not insured above that level, um, but we can in almost all cases kind of correct for that. And um, even though we have seen quite a bit of price volatility um, historically, it is always the case that we can um, sort of accommodate that. So it's- and Is there a product or an offering where it just like automatically does that? So like, as the price goes up, I'm just covered for the full amount or something? Yeah, so we you do- Just take take your fees or whatever out of my holdings. But like, I just know I can sleep at night knowing that if, like I said, if the price doubles tomorrow, I, I'm covered. Yeah, I mean, so that is that is effectively what we do. Um, the mm. So we are, I suppose, that product for our customers. Um, as you can imagine, it's- sometimes a bit of um, a bit of a complicated uh, logistical affair behind the scenes like we have to do a whole lot of right, um, right. you know negotiating speaking with and, and interacting with insurance markets mm-hmm. um, to constantly make sure that that those pegs are maintained uh, but that is a big point of the value add that we add for our own customers is not only are we you know the only place that they can go to get one-to-one um, insured custody we also take care of the massive headache of dealing with insurance markets. So we, you know, we take care of the headache of key management. We take care of the headache of dealing with insurance markets, uh, and we make it so that you know one can hold Bitcoin with us without having to deal with all of this complexity. Right, and then and then on the collusion question, right? Yeah, so how does uh, how do you guys insure against that? And what does that mean, even right? Like, what collusion is that? What like some employee at some company has like gone rogue? Is that what you guys mean? Or, but I, but I'd love to dig into that. Yeah, I'll walk bit. through the the other property. So, um, I guess we're walking through these. I gave you one to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Um, one to one naturally mm, means right? having to mm-hmm, deal with mm-hmm. volatility. Um, then we get into right. kind of the classes of risk that we like to cover. Um, and I'll get to mm. collusion last and then end with one final property. Uh, but briefly, the properties that we seek to cover are, you know, theft, loss due to, say, physical destruction. So, you know, um, somehow all of the keys that we hold um, get destroyed by, you know, a hurricane or a natural disaster or whatever the case, um, that absolutely must be insured. I can tell you that the likelihood of that is so low that it is relatively straightforward for us to gain that kind of insurance. Um, it is insured against theft from the outside. If somebody, you know, uh, breaks in somehow and manages to actually gain signing authority using our machinery, um, that should be a covered event. Uh, but to your point, collusion, internal collusion is one that we take really seriously. So that was one of the first things that we honed in on uh, when we started doing this to say, okay, suppose I, t- well, I pull myself out of Knox at the moment. I am a customer of Knox's. What is my number one fear about holding Bitcoin with Knox? My number one fear is that, you know, I don't know all of the employees who work at Knox personally. Um, I have done my diligence to understand the technology behind the scenes and to know that the likelihood of a theft or loss is very small. But I want to be assured that if Knox employees together um, form 
you know, some kind of internal cabal such that um, a theft ends up occurring, I want to know that that is explicitly covered. And so that is one of the most difficult properties to ensure. Um, and you can imagine why that is, you know, as a custodian, you have to be capable of moving the Bitcoin somehow. Um, and yet you have to make sure that no set of employees together can cause a loss um, or that the likelihood of that occurring is so low, one objectively it is so low that um, the, the probability of its occurrence is near zero, um, but secondarily that you can prove to the insurance markets that that is so. Um, and that's most of the kind of work, honestly, that Knox does is internal technology R&D. And some of the things that we've developed really serve to one, greatly reduce the likelihood of an internal collusion event. Um, and then also such that this technology is demonstrably safe to insurance markets. Uh, so one of the key things we do is we looked at the entire private key lifecycle and note that, hey, um, a majority of a key's life is spent just in signing. Um, and the way we have the system set up is we maintain a, at the moment, three of four multi-sig. Um, and in order to attain those three signatures, three distinct HSMs are engaged to sign on any one customer um, kind of fund movement. Those HSMs have a very important property, however, which is that even with direct physical access to them, our own employees are not actually capable of causing them to move funds. Um, so an explicit authorization needs to be issued by our customers. Um, and there's a kind of cryptographic guarantee that that is um, correctly bound, even though our customers do not actually maintain um, control of on-chain private keys. Um, and so that arrangement allowed us to both reduce the, you know, the likelihood of collusion significantly um, because we know that um, it is very difficult to cause a theft um, even when you have direct access to most of the physical internals um, and then to demonstrate that stuff to insurance markets. Um, and I can perhaps uh, speak to, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna just quickly, so it just cause um, like I'm pretty sure a lot of people aren't gonna know stuff some of those things like HSM. So that start stands for hardware security module, right? And that's just what, like, it's just like a, like a, a fancy computer that like banks and, and, you know, like super secure places like military bases and shit use, right? To, to essentially secure keys of, of any sort. But like, can you talk a little bit about that? Or do you know much about HSM? Just sure, yeah. Curious, so like, I'll, uh, I'll and keep like, this relatively simple because yeah. you could do an entire episode yeah, yeah, yeah. on HSM. Um, an HSM, mm. a hardware security module is to your point, a computer that is designed to do one very specific thing and one very specific thing um, very securely. Um, it is not kind of a general purpose computer. Um, it is not a, you know, PC running um, a Linux or something of the sort. Um, it, is a, it is a computer that has a very small attack surface, as we say, which is to say there's very few things that you can ask it to do. Um, and it is designed to do those things very well and to not allow anything else. Um, and so our hardware security module, this special computer, is programmed in such a way that it says, I am not going to produce an on-chain signature for this withdrawal request unless you, the operator of me, the HSM, can prove to me that the request is correct so far as the customer um, that is associated with this HSM um, says. Um, and so what happens is our customers hold um, their own set of what we call Knox access keys, uh, which allow that authorization to occur. Um, and it is kind of provably the case that if we are not in possession of those access keys, uh, then we can't move the funds um, and they can always make requests against our system with those keys. Um, and I think here I can stop for a moment to say, this is difficult to construct, but it is also difficult to ensure because when we first approached insurance markets with um, this you know, relatively ornate system, they looked at it and said, if true, incredible, and yes, we can you know, provide some this, this kind of extended coverage that you seek, but frankly, we are out of our technical element when it comes to um, assessing whether what you say is true, right? This, this, this whole notion that you have actually locked yourselves out of the system um, and that collusion is really unlikely um, sounds great on the surface, but we need to make sure that that is legitimately true. Um, and so we got into kind of a nice adversarial context where it's like, look, you guys go commission anyone you want um, in the world to look at our systems, and if this you know, independent third party can um, assert that the systems are as we say they are, um, then we can get on with um, actually insuring it. So um, a lot of the process of producing this insurance policy is kind of looking at all these properties that we want, making sure that each of them are potentially coverable, 
um, and then having to go through quite a bit of kind of third party technical assessment in order to prove that to be true. And once we completed those assessments, uh, we could finally get written for um, all of those properties, which again are kind of lost by way of destruction, you know, external theft, and then finally the internal theft due to internal collusion. Um, and then I'll leave this off with one final property that we think is important and that we did not see elsewhere, which is going back to the private key life cycle. You need to make sure that every single leg of the private key life cycle is insured for the properties that we stated. Um, so what we discovered is um, before we came along, nobody had actually insured against, for example, collusion during the key generation event. Um, and so even though a majority of a private key's life cycle might be spent in signing, um, it does, at least for a moment in time, exist during generation. And that too needs to be insured against um, all of those properties. And so we looked at the entire private key life cycle, kind of what is our process? How do we do global um, key generation storage and signing? Um, and can we make sure that every single leg of that is insured? Um, insured during generation, insured during any kind of transport, um, insured during signing once it's in our facilities, kind of making sure that uh, cradle to grave, there's not a single moment in time in which you can say, hey, this thing isn't insured. And um, so far as we're concerned, um, it's not a good argument to say, well, sure, you know, that leg is not insured, but it only occurs for, you know, 0.01% of the life of the key. Um, you know, theft and loss can happen at any point since we really wanted to make sure as a final property, all of those properties one-to-one -one with volatility across the entire key life cycle um, and that each of those things should be provably the case to our customers. And so um, that is really, it took, um, as you can imagine, a lot of a lot of grit to do that, uh, but we finally succeeded in, in producing just such a system. Uh, 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 Alex, are you allowed to talk about number one, who that insurer is and about your investors or is that uh, on the DL? I know some companies yeah, so, don't, I mean, don't, or do they have like- Some of our, I think- some of our investors um, wish to remain more silent, but uh, it's kind of known. I think if you do some digging, you'll probably discover uh, the full set. Um, but certainly on the venture side, uh, we have um, initialized capital um, and we love we love initialized capital and Inovia Capital, uh, which is a firm out of uh, Montreal. Um, in terms of the insurance carriers themselves, I think it's worth um, discussing some more details of what happens to an insurance policy behind the scenes. Um, so if you want to insure a very large sum of Bitcoin the way we have, um, there is not a single carrier in the world that will take on that full risk. Um, so there's no one you can go to and say, you know, I want to write a uh, three, four hundred million dollar policy. Um, and so what happens is you construct what is called an insurance tower. Um, and I think I can describe an insurance tower pretty simply based on theoretical kind of theft or loss events. Um, suppose you know, somebody managed to, you know, whether by internal collusion or, um, you know, physical destruction or internal theft, um, cause a loss at Knox. Um, suppose that loss were, you know, $35 million worth. Um, there would be somebody sitting at what you call the base of the tower who might have said, okay, I'll take 100% of the loss from zero to 5 million. Um, and then maybe some other carrier sitting between 5 million and 15 million saying, I'll take all of that loss. Um, and then you can imagine, you can also kind of slice it vertically. So maybe somebody says, okay, I'll take 20% of the loss from uh, kind of 20 million to 35 million. And so in its most basic construction, you can imagine that kind of um, ability to transfer those risks to not one single carrier, but many carriers. Um, and these kinds of insurance towers um, are not new. They're not, um, they're not something constructed specifically for Bitcoin. Uh, they're quite common in the world of reinsurance, uh, which is the industry um, that effectively insures the insurers. Um, and they'll sit and say, the kinds of massive losses we're talking about here are so extreme that no entity in the world is going to want to take them on. Um, so I'll give you as a simple example, suppose you're insuring against um, you know, damage to homes and you happen to be, you know, you have a lot of homes in Florida that happen to be exposed to a large hurricane. Um, typically many years can go by, you don't have massive claims but then one massive hurricane rips through and then suddenly you have such a large hit that you would as an insurer otherwise become insolvent. Um, you have effectively insured yourself against that very unlikely scenario, uh, but because the sum of the loss is so large, um, you will have reached out to many different reinsurers in order to cover that. And so a lot of those same tricks are parlayed into um, the world of Bitcoin insurance, which is you know how do you get hundreds of millions of dollars of risk um, transferred when um, you know, no one entity wants to take on the full risk. 
I mean, I, I you probably don't want to share like the details of how, but I mean, I'm so super curious. I'm sure when someday you'll release the movie on how you guys made it all happen. But like, you know, talking to financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, um, it's not easy, you know, about Bitcoin because oftentimes people, um, as you mentioned at the beginning of your story, they associate it with dark markets and nefarious activity, and so to not be able to just like get a meeting with them, but to eventually like get it to the finish line where you have. Uh, yeah, you have an actual product that that you know serves the market. I think it's awesome. Hey, I was gonna say. So, um, it, did you? Was there anything else you wanted to share around Knox? Um, yeah, any any other key highlights or I don't know developments or things that people should know about or maybe even like who is your kind of your, you know, target uh, audience or your market or whatever. Like, who is it that's mostly coming to you? And and if someone. I mean, there's probably going to be a total of three people listening to this because I just started this, but you know what I mean? Like uh, from my mom and my dad, you know, like, no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, no, if, if people want to find out like about like, you know, does this apply to them? Should they be looking in further? Um, what types of, you know, people are, are you really targeting? Yeah, sure. For your so product? I'll give you kind of, um, I like to do it in three buckets probably. Um, one is Bitcoin businesses that aside, as a side effect of their operations happen to store large sums of Bitcoin. Um, so an example is, um, mm. say, BitBuy, because they're an exchange, they'll say, okay, look, I, um, you know, we don't want to hold this Bitcoin on behalf of our customers. You know, we, we wish they would withdraw, but hey, a lot of people don't want to withdraw, and so we want to give them this option. Uh, but, you know, one, we don't want to deal with this, um, you know, large liability, and we want to make sure that it is maintained by a specialized um, entity such as yourselves. And we really love this insurance coverage, and we want to um, explain to our customers that, that uh, you guys are insured. Um, and so that's one pretty straightforward um, off the cuff example. Another set is the world of uh, kind of registered investment advisors as they're called in Canada and they go by other names elsewhere, um, high net worth individuals, family offices, kind of entities that are starting to look at this and this is increasingly the case. They're looking at this and saying, you know, I should have some part of my portfolio in Bitcoin. Um, you know, and then this is the old pump line, you know, I don't know what the right number is for you. I know what the wrong number is and that is zero. You know, you should always have some kind of allocation. Um, and the problem there, of course, for them is they store, they don't self custody anything, any of the assets that they are holding either for themselves or on behalf of their own customers. So a specialized, um, you know, Bitcoin custodian is necessary. And certainly because the set that we think is moving in um, that we're seeing kind of move in now and I think will be increasingly the case in 2021 is kind of more risk averse than the last wave that came before them. Uh, this insurance piece ends up being um, important. They say, um, you know, I want these properties and I definitely don't want to store it myself. Um, but one, I like this. Um, I like these insurance properties and I want to be able to explain to, um, you know, to the family or to whoever else I'm holding this for that um, this stuff is insured properly. Um, maybe, yeah. And continue, then lastly, continue. the last one is kind of just uh, funds. Uh, so publicly listed funds, you know, um, there's a lot of talk of, um, as some people say, you know, Bitcoin is not on the menu in, in many ways. Um, there's certain methods by which certain entities want to purchase um, exposure to assets. Um, and they will not do something like buy Bitcoin on an exchange and then hold it for themselves. Um, one, they expect the custody to be taken care of. Um, and they expect the execution to occur in a particular way. Um, and so that is something that uh, we're really set up to enable. I think we're seeing just the first small, first kind of few live instances of, of these things um, in the wild um, kind of this year. And I think that you're going to see a pretty wide flourishing of that stuff in the future. Um, yeah, hey, I'll just to, just to kind of take this into a little bit deep waters here. Are you comfortable talking about Quadriga and maybe some of the the kind of the regulatory situation, if you will? I mean, if if you if you're uncomfortable, we can just skip it. No, that's, the next that's question. I mean, but I just think it's like it's, sometimes it's nice to call it the pink elephants. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean, Quadriga. I suppose um, if anyone's listening to this from outside of Canada, um, Quadriga was a situation in which um, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin uh, effectively disappeared because. Um, it was found that Gerald Cotton, kind of the guy who was running this exchange, um, you know, disappeared, which I won't dwell on and whether, you know, he's still around or what, whatever happened. Um, I, I met him once. I met him <laughs> once. I'll save that one for another episode. Yeah. But yeah, continue. continue. Um, and 
hey, all the money's gone. Um, all the all the Bitcoin's gone because, ah. you know, I'm sitting on, you know, he's sitting on the on the private keys and whoa, what happened? And so this was a huge what problem. What happened again, course. though? He died, right, in India, right? Or Yeah, so died. I mean, the, the official story is that he died in India and was cremated. Um, I think certainly a lot of people believe, and I won't get into maybe my own beliefs here, that uh, he's alive and is just a, an out-and-out scammer and just took all of this Bitcoin. Yeah, the last uh, but, thing I want is a, a dead rich guy after me, a dead rich guy after me <laughs> right? <laughs> with, the, right. you know, all that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyways, and so carry on. Few, so there's a few places that this rattled. So I can go through them. One, certainly mm. it rattled. I think a lot of Canadian retail investors um, still to this day, kind of mainstream press when they write about Bitcoin. Now they're going to pull this up and say, well, look at this is one of the dangers, um, which I wish they would just write that and then say, this is why one should um, perhaps, you know, take control of their own keys. Um it got the regulators certainly rattled um, because they realized that, hey, we don't necessarily know how this activity occurs. And, you know, we can't tell the good actors from the bad actors. Um, so if I'm being kind of kind to the regulators, they can't tell the difference between um, a quadriga and a bit by. They can't tell the difference between a quadriga and a unicoin, things of the sort. Um, and certainly this is something that, uh, you know, we're, we're working strongly with um, various customers of ours to say, these kinds of events cannot occur as severely um, as they did with Quadriga. And this is how you should look into, into this industry. Um, and here's how um, a set of actors are playing nicely. And this is what it looks like for a system to be safe um, and kind of helping them see that if they want to actually maintain you know, consumer safety, which is ultimately um, their core mandate, um, then there are ways um, and it should not be by way of regulating the companies out of existence. That's certainly something that um, concerns us and everyone else. And um, we've seen perhaps Canada has done this a little bit more than most. Um, we don't think that these companies should be regulated out of existence. But if you guys want to make sure that you're you know, supporting your core mandate of enabling consumer safety, uh, then there are ways to look into this and to make sure that everything um, is going down correctly. Um, and that, you know, there's not going to be a large theft or loss event. And certainly for us, a major point of that is uh, this insurance point. Um, the thing we tell people, and sometimes this is interesting for folks, is it's not only that we are insured um, such that a claim can be made. Um, it is knowing that no serious set of entities like these large insurance companies that have skin in the game in the sense that they would have to pay out a claim um, if something happened at Knox would have signed up for this program if the system weren't safe, right? So um, sometimes people say, oh, do you think that Quadriga should have been insured so that this you know, funds could have been returned? I can tell you Quadriga could not have been insured because the method by which they stored Bitcoin was so incredibly dangerous um, that no insurance company would ever have signed up for that. So sometimes um, I think that the insurance um, heuristic is important, not just because it exists such that a claim event can be made, uh, but that you know that there's been a lot of due diligence conducted on that entity before it could actually purchase that insurance policy. Um, and I think to this day, an insurance policy is, again, besides the claim point, the best independent audit that can be conducted on a company. Um, so we are going to release, for example, our SOC 2 Type 2 um, potentially soon. But while that is requested by some folks, we think that the ability to um, show that we are insured is actually the best marker for safety uh, for any kind of independent audit that has ever been conducted on our systems. Fascinating, cool. That that's great. Um, anything else on on the Knox front that that you you want to share? I mean, I had a couple of slightly like I don't know, uh, just yeah, just different questions on that on the insurance. I just find it so fascinating because because it has to do with risk, you know, and like quantifying risk, which is everything. Um, okay, I'm going to go on a little, like, do you mind if I go on like a, like a one minute rant on, sure, on yeah, something? Please, that please. I, something that go ahead. So, so like two, so like, so like, I don't know, it's a long time ago, um, uh, like 20, almost 20 years ago, sitting in a boardroom of like a really high up building in downtown Toronto, there's like 20 of us and we're doing this thing called breakfast with CEO. We're like young people trying to like, you know, uh, try to meet like people that were successful. And there's this gentleman who, 
shared this like anecdote with me or with us rather that I'll never forget. And he, and he, his first question was, was like, how many of you guys want to become entrepreneurs in this room? And almost, um, you know, I mean, everyone would like say, yeah, like, a, like it sounds interesting, but almost nobody actually was like, yeah, I really want to be an entrepreneur. And he was like, well, what's the number one reason that, that you guys don't want to become an entrepreneur? And the number one reason was because it was, it was something that everyone perceived to be risky. And, and the guy goes, if I can somehow um, illustrate to you that being an entrepreneur is less risky than, than the other way, would you be you know, interested in, in hearing my argument? We're like, all right, sure. So he's like, okay. So I, I, he throws out this thesis. He's like, risk is a function of two things, information and control. He's like, so what do I mean by this? So let's say, for example, you're like physically sitting beside me right now, right? And there's like an anvil that's about to fall on us. I'm aware of the fact that it's about to fall on us and you're not. Um, who's at more risk? Probably you because you have less information than I do. So information is obviously important. And the second thing is, is control, right? And so what that means is that let's say both of us know it's going to fall, but my legs are shackled to this table and I can't literally physically move then I'm at more risk. So he broke it down in this like really kind of nice way. And then he fast forwarded into this, like kind of this example. He's like, well, now think of John. He's worked for this company for 30 years. He's, uh, you know, put in his hard work and all of a sudden some smart MBA guy gets hired. And, um, you know, Sunday he's barbecuing, Monday he's there and he finds out that, uh, you know, due to unforeseen circumstances, he no longer has his, his job. Um, the question is, how much information did John have in that situation and how much, you know, control? Like, could he, did he know it was coming? Did he know, like, the budgets of the companies? Did he know the market analysis? Did he know? Probably not. Did he know also, and, and how much control? Could he beg, plead, you know, argue, cheat? Could he do anything in that situation? Probably not. Like, he's, he's out the door. So his argument was, like, the level of, you know, kind of... Um, uh, the level of like risk that you're taking is high. Whereas as an entrepreneur, you know, if you think of the, let's say the CEO of that company, um, number one, he probably has a team of people looking at like the market analysis and figuring out what the trends in his industry are and, and all this. And so anyway, so but my, my point is, is that, I, you know, risk, I always thought of it along those two axes, like how much information do I have about a given opportunity or a given circumstance? And then how much control can I exercise? So I'm curious, does that... Like, how do you think about, like, not risk in, like, the context of Bitcoin, insurance, and custody, but just generally, like, do you have some axioms by which you think about risk on, Alex? Yeah, sure. And I think, let me focus in on kind of the information control points, because I think that's yeah. good from, from the perspective mm -hmm. of viral customers, right? Which is, if you're going to use a third-party custodian, this is exactly the problem is, you can do as much due diligence as you want to discover broadly, you know, you have some information, okay, this is how they custody. This seems pretty safe to me. They do multi-sig in, in Knox's case, kind of keys are distributed across five cities, just extreme risk spread, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't have perfect information, right? I don't have a omnipresent view into all of the things that are being conducted there. Um, and so that is a reason why, you know, I fear this risk and I wish it to be transferred. I wish to be able to, um, you know, have that have that risk that is originated kind of fully insured. And then on the control point, which is the fact that I have ceded control, technically speaking, to this entity because they're the ones moving funds, um, is disconcerting to me. And we've gone to great lengths to make sure that our customers, you know, truly have control. Um, so in the form of, for example, the collusion controls that we've enacted, not only reduce the likelihood of our, um, you know, agents stealing from the inside of the system, it because um, has kind of reverted and sort of brought control back to the entity, uh, which one gains them a lot of comfort, gains the insurers a lot of comfort, um, and ultimately makes the risk much, um, much lower. Um, I think another point I can tell you the way I think about risk, and I think you you have it here, risk can be managed, and risk management can be attained through a number of different mechanisms, not just insurance policies. Um, and I've always been fascinated by the latent behavior that wants to exist, but does not exist because the entities who would otherwise willingly engage that behavior um, perceive that risk to be there. Um, and that if they don't have a method to transfer it, then they won't engage it. So I'll go back to say the room of, of you guys um, you know, down there, um, thinking about uh, say starting companies or doing whatever. If there was massive personal risks associated to this, you would not engage that activity. Um, and so as an example, just something like the corporation, the limited liability, um, like LLCs have 
substantially reduced, for example, the personal risk to starting a company. And it led to a, an explosion of the number of companies started, which ends up being a massive boon for society. Um, and so in the same way, one of the things we think about risk this way is where can you see that some activity wants to exist, but the reason it is not existing is that appropriate risk transfer mechanisms have not yet been enacted. And certainly I think Bitcoin ownership um, is one such example. Um, a lot of these entities that they want the price appreciation, they want to know that they own Bitcoin, um, but they're so worried about theft and loss risk that they're not engaging the activity at all. And so they're saying, you know, I'm so worried about um, that downside uh, that even though I, I already believe that there's an incredible upside to it, I'm not going to go and engage it. And that's really the best actually way to paint Knox is to say, what we have done is produced a vehicle whereby you can enjoy the upside um, and cap the downside um, by paying, in our case, a small AUC fee that includes us purchasing insurance for you behind the scenes. And so we really exist to do just that, which is for those entities that will never want to hold their own keys um, and want to engage this world, but the, what was holding them back was the risk of theft and loss. Uh, we want to enable those folks to go from zero to one to not um, to not have to worry about the things that they otherwise worry about. Um, so I think that's a good one to use. And you can see it historically also, there's just been a lot of cases where you know some activity has exploded precisely because the risk was transferred. So um, a massive uptick, for example, in the case of um, entrepreneurship and, and others, when people stopped being, say, personally responsible for um, some of what would happen. You know, you didn't have back when a king could uh, and very likely would kill you if something went wrong um, with the company that you're running. Um, at the moment, you know, being able to, uh, you know, reduce that risk for people leads to an explosion in some activity, um, which you really want to encourage if you want societies to develop. Yeah, so risk is interesting. And, and you know, and some people, they're like, they're like, oh, I, I don't like risk. Or they say things like, oh, I'm risk averse. And it's like, all of us are always taking risks, you know, it's just a matter of being able to, uh, you know, even as like an entrepreneur, it's like, there's like insurance risk and like, oh, I might die. But then there's also like, there's an, a business opportunity that I think that exists. It's like, well, how risky is it? Uh, not just like how much money could it potentially make and all that, but like, because that that's like such an important, you know, part of the equation when you're making decisions. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, so fascinating. Hey, okay, so um, I guess, so should we, I, don't, I know we're, we're, we're doing, oh, uh, so yeah, maybe I'll move on to the next part of uh, the contrarian belief question. So any, any truths that you feel that you hold that most other Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Yeah, so one of the things certainly I've always thought about um, is what could do damage to Bitcoin? Kind of what um, what am I actually afraid of? And I think there's a lot that people um, you know typically pull out, but most of which have been debunked uh, pretty thoroughly. I mean, you still see them come up, but I think um, amongst Bitcoiners, it's, it's known that this is kind of ludicrous. You know, the government's going to ban it or um, kind of all of these other risks. I think one, and I don't know if this is contrary in the sense that I'm sure people agree with me, um, on, but I don't know that it is spoken about enough. And perhaps this is just due to my own kind of interest in uh, programming languages and how software functions correctly. Um, the biggest risk that I fear, say, for Bitcoin is a fault in, you know, the underlying protocol. Um, so, you know, whether it's a fault in um, ECDSA or Schnorr in the future, or just a program error that is introduced, um, we have seen, you know, unexploited um, inflation bugs and things of the sort. I really, I love software and I love what it can enable, uh, but I also fear software um, because getting software right, making sure that it is correct is an enormously difficult task. Um, and so when you have something like a very high value system like Bitcoin um, and it exists as software, um, it excites me greatly. And <laughs> one of the reasons that I'm in the field, but um, it also worries me. So one of the, you know, the biggest fear I have is either accidental or um, nefarious kind of correctness faults within the protocol itself. Um, and I think it's something that we should spend, I guess, the rest of our lives ensuring that it does not happen. So if you want, um, if Bitcoin becomes as we all want it to be, the world reserve currency um, and it exists as software, um, making sure that the, that software is correct is going to become ever more important. Um, so, of course, it's important to anyone who holds Bitcoin now, um, but it is still a relatively you know, small drop in the kind of sea of um, stores of value and assets and everything of the sort. Um, if this grows, and I fully believe it will, um, to become the principal store of value 
and the money at the base of all of society, um, making sure that the stuff is correct is, is really, really important. Yeah, uh, so definitely, definitely couldn't agree with you more on that one. Um, and then what about the same question as it pertains, let's say, to the world at large? Any thoughts around that one? Like any, uh, I don't know, I mean, there's so many things to be contrarian about today in this day and age, but sure. anything you want to share? And yeah, again, to the extent of this contrarian, I think it's just not thought about enough. Um, and I'll back off from Bitcoin for a second, but I will say that and this is also kind of a, a core focus of, of Knox's in the, in the grand term. Um, societies increasingly rely on complicated intertwined software systems and the most dangerous events that can transpire at the moment have at the root of them a software error potential. Um, a story I like to recount for this point to kind of prove how serious it is, um, is what we saw happen with uh, the NotPetya worm. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but effectively, um, let's call it Russia. I mean, they claim to this day that's not the case, but very likely they kind of produced some, some malware that it infected some Ukrainian computer systems. Uh, and it ended up spreading so quickly that a whole bunch of computers around the world were infected. Um, and you can zoom in on one particular company, uh, Maersk, which does you know global shipping and kind of compare them today and them 30 years ago. 30 years ago, they did something very similar to what they do today, which is they take cargo, they put it on some ships and they move it between ports. Um, and this is you know, hugely valuable for society, uh, but they had a full, and to your point about information control, they had a full understanding of how the system should function and it was insured from A to Z. If an employee steals you know, a, um, something from a container that will be covered, um, if a ship goes down, that will be covered. Uh, you know, if there's some scenario where a port is inaccessible and some customers are losing money, that'll be covered. You know, they have this stuff insured A to Z. Now, when NotPetya came along and infected their computer systems, it didn't matter that this was a shipping company with physical ships around the world and that what they did was deal in physicality. Their entire operation was controlled by software. Um, and so they were actually in a more precarious spot in the modern age where all of their systems are controlled by software than they were 30 years ago when it was just pen, uh, kind of pencil and paper. And so for a lot of software people, you know, we kind of, we love the extent to which software has seeped into society and how much it runs. Um, but one of the things that, you know, scares me is that we likely have lost oversight and have lost um, insight into the kinds of serious events that can occur. And so I think that they are lie dormant some, you know, serious, potentially close to world ending, or at least sort of society destroying events that at the base of them um, exist precisely because we have come to rely so much on software. Um, so that's kind of my words of warning for myself and everyone else kind of going into the century, which is software is great and we want the money to be software and we want a whole lot of things to be software, um, but we should be very concerned about the kinds of systemic faults that may lie dormant within software systems. Um, and frankly, you know, being kind of a software person myself, um, anyone who has programmed systems can tell you that for the most part, a whole lot of the world is um, duct taped together, um, at least in kind of the software realm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so true, so true. Uh, yeah, well, have you ever heard of a guy named Raymond Kurzweil? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah he, interest. Yeah. yeah, he has this famous saying, I'm going to butcher it, obviously, but it's something along the lines that, you know, in the end, we'll realize that we're not hardware, we're software. Um, so so that takes me to my, you know, uh, this, so you mentioned how software can be scary, and we're talking about, you know, pretty simple software systems. Have you thought much about, you know, AI and things like that? I mean, I know Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and all these billionaires are talking about it now, and it's becoming kind of a, a hot topic, but, um, and when I say AI, I'm not talking about, you know, the Tesla driving itself. I'm talking, I'm not talking about even Bitcoin, which maybe some consider to be, you know, maybe the first real AI, but I mean like this, 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 like, uh, this general AI that people sometimes refer to that, you know, may become a reality in the next couple of decades. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I kind of go back and forth on this. Um, and I guess this point is, you know, is AGI kind of generalized intelligence going to appear in our lifetimes? Um, and if it does, is it going to spell the end of humanity? 
um, you know, some folks say, you know, we are effectively a kind of bootloader for this thing, you know, humans in, when you look back thousands of years, we'll say, you know, humans evolved over yeah, hundreds of thousands of years just to become smart enough to build computer systems yeah. in order to actually launch the next thing. Um, there's yeah. scaffolds, you know, they did, they, they mattered in that they made this thing rise, but it is actually more important than uh, the humans themselves. I just pictured uh, one of those floppy disks with like some duct yeah. tape on it right now as like humanity, yeah. but anyways, continue. <laughs> I'm not especially, and I think we'll see as this happens. Um, I don't expect to see AGI in the really near term, um, I would not be surprised if we don't see it in our lifetimes. Um, but certainly the advancements that we're seeing within artificial intelligence are, are pretty interesting and some, something that I also kind of, you know, I'm not involved in um, AI directly, but I do pay quite a bit of attention to it. Um, seeing things like GPT-3, um, some of the kind of interesting models um, that are capable of mimicking um, a lot of human behavior um, have been certainly interesting to me. I'll tell you about one bet actually with the same guy. So the guy I was telling you who I, I'm internally debating technical things with him because um, I guess he's uh, very much a techno pessimist, if you will. Um, and I'm no kind of utopian, but as scary as I think software is, I do also think that it is um, the answer to a lot of the world's problems. Um, so the same guy who I debated whether um, Bitcoin was a valid currency in 2013, I have a bet with him that on June 7th, 2048, um, he will fail the Turing test kind of a hundred times in a row, which is to say, I get a hundred instances in which he gets to communicate by text with a, with a either machine or human. Um, and he has to get hundred percent success rate. In no case will he label a computer, a person or a person, a, a, a um, computer. Um, and I feel pretty strongly that I will win that bet. Um, so that's maybe one case where I actually have um, skin in the game. Um, Okay. Have you made a bet like that? So okay, you know, okay. 2048, it's a long time from now. So you're running but, your own Turing test? So, I mean, that's the idea. He's going to do 100 <laughs> instances of a Turing test and he needs to get it 100% right. Um, I think he'll lose. While I think he'll lose, I don't think that the thing that is going to back um, the computer agents will be properly considered an AGI. Um, it will just be a, for example, just very advanced form of something that looks like GPT-3. It will be able to understand what it means to live a life and it will be able to answer, you know, the deepest philosophical questions that you can po uh, pose it. Um, and it will be able to do so in a way that um, perfectly mimics, you know, from a kind of language symbolic perspective, um, that which a human might say. Have you read the the one by the Bitcoin guy that, that is Marzon or whatever he wrote about GPT-3? Did you, did you see? I always talk about this. It's no. so I got to figure out this guy's name. But it's like I was just like Googling, you know, Bitcoin, GPT-3 stuff. And this is the first article that came up. And it was this guy who's kind of an OG. I don't think I've ever met him. But um, it's we had this article about how he, he, you know, Bitcoin talk is. It's like the most popular forum or whatever for Bitcoin yeah. people. And they he, he it's this article about how he came up, devised his test. He started making these little... Um, um, you know, comments using GPT-3 and putting them on uh, onto Bitcoin Talk, and they started performing really well. There are other stories like this in, in other platforms as well. It started performing really well, and and then it's like this analysis and this breakdown of like the findings and this and that. And then at the end of the article, it's like dash line, dash line, and then it's like, by the way. Uh, like disclaimer, I did not write this entire article. I haven't been to Bitcoin talk in like five years. Like GPT-3 came up with this whole experiment and this whole idea and everything was like by it. <laughs> and it was like, yeah. all I did was I just generated 10 versions of like, you know, a similar story. And I just, I all and all I fed it was like my name, you know, just like four lines of text. Like this is what I do. This is a link to my website. And that was pretty much it. And it, you know, crafted this, this, this whole like elaborate narrative that was like perfect. Oh, but I agree with you, man. Like I get so many calls on my phone. Like I would say 99% of the phone calls that I receive on my phone are like, it's like robots and like weird, you know, things. And it's like, like what's going to happen when these people start using these, these technologies. And now all of a sudden it's like, wait, is this a human or like, am, am I talking to, you're not going to know, right. We're going to need like, I don't know, like AI goggles or something. Um, okay. So, okay. So let's just forget the AGI. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, but it's in undeniable that technology itself is on this March. Right. I mean, like I said, I always talk about my Tesla. Like it blows my mind that I have a car that freaking drives itself, dude. How many people on planet Earth drive for a living? Probably 
higher than zero, right? Like it's, it's like, it's like, it's like millions, maybe tens of millions. I don't know how many people like Uber, like what happens five years from now when every car drives itself? Like, um, are we going to tell those people go learn how to program now? GPT three does that too. Supposedly there's some, there's some project called decode or something where you just tell it in natural language, like build me a website that does this, this, and this. And it just generates the code for you. So, so telling people that you should become a coder is no longer an answer, but do you, do you think it's, it's Luddite of me uh, to be thinking that, that we might be for the first time in history at a point where um, the pace of innovation and job loss may exceed the pace at which we might be able to like reasonably replace them. Yeah, so I mean, and I've seen this question posed um, a lot, which is every single time, you know, some new technology comes along, we say this is going to kill all the jobs. Um, and every time the question is, is this time different? Is there something fundamentally different about this time such that we really will not find more to do? Um, and I have, you know, I'll stay away from, I have a hard time answering that. Um, there's a good book on kind of some of the stuff, the second machine age, I don't know if you've come across that one. Um, and the answers to, you know, how we're going to deal with society um, as this occurs are, you know, anybody's guess. I think Bitcoin certainly has a big answer to this in the form of, um, instead of thinking about UBI and things like that, appreciate the deflationary nature of technology and do not try to fight it. Uh, so these are kind of some, some Jeff Luther ideas, which is, hey, if we actually had a sound money and if we built our society with a sound money, um, then we would actually get this kind of, um, you know, ability to not, for example, have to labor all day um, in order to just be able to live so that we could focus on creative projects or, hey, um, writing more software or, you know, perhaps um, so that all of us could spend all of our time um, making sure that Bitcoin is correct because it is the basis of this new society um, and doing so without expecting um, anybody to pay us for it. Um, it's, it's a set of interesting questions. I am not certain how we should uh, deal with these things, but I think certainly um, I wish more people would think about the deflationary nature of technology um, and whether it makes sense for base money to be um, even mildly inflationary in that um, in that context. Um, and I think that I've come kind of around to these kinds of Jeff Booth ideas that you can actually potentially solve for a lot of these problems um, by way of having, say, a sound money. It's so funny because I used to have so much like hurt in my heart you know when I learned about the system and like how it works and all that and it was always like pain and anger and like you just you just thought well maybe if I just vote in the right guy all this will change but when Bitcoin came in my life it was like this like you know sky parting moment it was like wow I can actually like put my mind and my effort and my resources and my energy and my time towards something that I believe in instead of just working against things that I don't um, and so, yeah, I definitely can, can, can agree with a lot of the stuff you said uh, there. Okay, so I, I want to be mindful of your time as well. So we are at that 90 minute mark. I wanted to give you a chance to maybe share. I don't know if people want to follow your personal kind of like thoughts. Do you blog much? Do you, um, and then the company website and all that kind of stuff, if you don't mind the Twitter handle, all that, all that stuff so that people can, you know, get at you. Sure, yeah. Um, so certainly uh, on Twitter, you can find me at my last name, D-A-S-K-A-L-O-V. Um, you can find Knox at knoxcustody.com um, or just Google Knox Custody, I'm sure will come up. Um, and certainly yeah, if you need insured Bitcoin holdings, um, you know, we're the place to go. Uh, so please feel free to reach out. I think, uh, as you noted, Sunny, just uh, there's a spot on our website where you can reach out to us, schedule a demo, kind of um, come to speak to us more about the product. Um, that's how you first reached out. And uh, so it's an cool, effective yeah. way. And then yeah, otherwise, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, custody.com is uh, where we post various articles. Um, I write some of them sometimes. I think, you know, I always wish I was writing more, um, finding the time to do that. Um, there's a recent article actually I posted um, about some of the points that I covered here, which is how, you know, insurance in most cases is just marketing and why that shouldn't be the case, but why it is the case and what kinds of things you should be thinking about. Um, yeah. Otherwise, we have a lot of pieces. Um, most of the the, you know, good content, I guess, suppose is written by Tebow. Um, and you'll come across some of that there as well. Um, yeah, he's, he's a great writer. I like his stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And perhaps I'll end on a parting thought and just uh, to wrap up kind of your AI points, risk software, all of that. Um, there's a few things I believe will happen in this century. One is that a majority of insurance policies that are purchased will be purchased against non-material events. So events that occur in software space, um, whether that be on the internet or kind of mal events that occur because of failure of software systems. 
Um, and I further believe that a majority of the entities purchasing insurance and originating risk uh, will not be people. Um, so not only do I think most insurance will be purchased against software failure, um, I think that the purchasers of those policies will be software themselves. Um, and so you can imagine that since you know insurance policies are useful to cover um, risks and to, to kind of transfer risks, um, there's no reason why AI systems should not be themselves um, kind of purchasing and, and transferring insurance. Um, and we'll see maybe a lot of these worlds will kind of, kind of come to melt together. Um, interestingly, I'm also at the moment, maybe just a couple of kilometers away from uh, Mila, which is uh, Yashua Bengio's um, kind of uh, intel artificial intelligence um, lab out here in Montreal. And so there's an interesting symbiosis, if you will, of kind of artificial intelligence and other technologies that occur in Montreal. So um, yeah, didn't come to think that I'd be speaking about AI during a bit. Hey, hey, I was going to ask you, but... do you have, do you have a few more minutes or do you have to run? Cause I want to oh, ask I've, you one I've, more question. I have some time here. Yeah. Hey Alex, well, one more question for you. Um, Okay, so I was pretty like anti ICO, like I was, and I, I've I've even been very critical of Ethereum over the years, right? Um, but but it's kind of hard to deny that it it does seem like there's so there's a bit of innovation going on, if you want to call it that, or at least this whole DeFi thing has the world of buzz. I'm just curious. I've seen some attempts at doing insurance on the blockchain. Do you think? that's even something worth attempting or are those, are these people literally just like trying to scam people out of their money? That's I, my question. <laughs> that's a good question. I think at the moment, most of these things are toys, um, which I don't mind toys, you know, experimentation is, is kind of cool. Um, and by these things you're months. including Ethereum in there. So this maybe gets back to software correctness point. You want to be really careful with the durability of software. Um, maybe for kind of experimentation sake, some of these things are okay. I don't believe that one of the points I'll make is I, I don't mind smart contracts in theory. Um, I think that one should be careful with how they're constructed. I think that the way they exist in Ethereum is likely dangerous um, and not going to lead to great outcomes. Um, I am excited, however, about things like discrete log contracts and some of the things that will exist on top of Bitcoin. Um, I do think that yes, one day, and this is a topic that we could spend our own 90 minutes on, the way that insurance is purchased today is not going to be, you know, insurance programs of the future will look nothing like insurance programs today. Um, at the moment, I think it is something like 40% of premiums are consumed by the risk transfer machine, if you will, um, underlying um, the world of insurance. Um, and that is because it is horribly inefficient. Um, there will be ways in the future to gain the kinds of insurance that we have. Um, in entirely automated software-based insurance programs. Um, and I think, for example, um, DLCs and things like that will be able to power some of these programs in the future. It is not the case for, at, at the moment, our insurance is fully rooted in the old world, if you will, um, in the sense of being important for these kinds of risk-averse institutions when they do their due diligence. One of the things they check is, you know, what is the credit worthiness of the carriers behind your program? Um, you know, can I, rest assured that this thing is regulated correctly, um, that a claim event can actually be honored, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so even if some of these things functioned, we would likely not be able to use them in most cases. Um, but I think we'll be surprised at how quickly some of this stuff comes to flourish. And yeah, I think that um, very likely a parallel insurance industry will start to exist in order to ensure things like software risks. Um, and it will then eventually subsume kind of the entire traditional insurance industry. So one day, you know, somebody will be also purchasing uh, their car insurance through systems like this. Um, I won't make guesses as to how quickly that comes, but uh, that's its own that's its own wide ranging topic. So we can kind of step outside. Yeah, yeah, of the let, 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 yeah. Let's stop there. This has been super fascinating, man. I, I really appreciate you taking on all these. Uh, I call them American gladiator style questions, but they're not so hard, right? Uh, but dude, if you if you want in the future to do this again in a week, a month, a year, whenever at all, uh, just hit me up because uh, yeah, both you and and Thibaut, you guys are, you guys are super smart, and I really appreciate your perspective. Okay, so with that. Maybe we can bring it to an end. Any anything you want to say in closing, or should we should we bring this? No, I think that's great. Close? Yeah. So thanks, thanks for your time. Really great speaking to you. Uh, and uh, um, probably see you in Toronto, perhaps sometime in December or something. Let's see. Yeah, maybe one of those steak yeah, dinners right. again. Woo! <laughs> All right, All right man. Have a good day. Thanks for coming.